didn't want to talk to him. It's fine. 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 I guess we can get started. Am I on? I'm on. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I had a few people call me and say, oh, it's supposed to storm out there. I don't know if I'll be able to make it. And I wait a minute, storm. I checked my, uh, my uh, app, and it said 40% chance at 9 o'clock. I wasn't going to give them a hard time. So. But well, we got a bunch of people online anyway. Well, uh, thanks for taking time out to uh, come. A couple of uh, housekeeping items. Uh, if you need to use the ladies' room or the men's room, the code is 521-ENTER. That's 521-ENTER. Also, if you would silence your cell phones, that would be greatly appreciated. Or if not, uh, we have a jar back here. It costs you a dollar every time your phone rings. Even if it only has a half a ring, still a dollar. See, so he's bringing it out already. Got some water back there in case you want it. All right, so, um, wow, there's so much to talk about, but uh, I do want to start with a couple of uh, things. First one being, I get probably an email, a text, or a call every day or every other day inquiring about any new deals coming up. All right, does anybody want to know about, good, uh, about new deals coming up? We don't have any. Um, just know this, that uh, we are uh, diligently looking every day, making offers, and um, it's, a, it's a tough market, but we are, we are making some progress. Uh, tough market is this. Uh, who believes we're in a very strong real estate market right now? Everybody, right? Well, we are, but my opinion and my opinion only, and my humble opinion, we're probably in one of the most dangerous markets I have ever been in in my 30-something years of real estate. And so someone might ask, well, why would you say that? I mean, prices are going up. Everybody's, you know, I am here rents are going up. Well, it's not that the, the market isn't going up. It's not that demand isn't there. It's that uh, from my perspective, and Darwin would agree, and I think uh, Brian would as well, is that when you're trying to deploy capital, your hard-earned capital, in a market that is so highly competitive, you still have to be mindful of the core um, tenets of how we invest. And that is, one, protect our investors' money, make sure that we make the returns that we want to, understanding the environment that we find ourselves in. And so it's real easy when I'm getting these calls, we're getting, it isn't just me, Darwin gets them, Brian gets them, Garrett gets them, um, to, to, to kind of feel pressure to find something to shut you guys up, right? <laughs> but that would be stupid, wouldn't it, right? It'd be stupid because then we would be abandoning our core positions of how we invest. And so when I say it's one of the most dangerous markets that I've ever seen is for a couple of reasons. One, the demand is driving the prices higher every day. There is, the market's a wash in capital. And there are some uncertainties. We've got political uncertainties. We still have COVID to deal with. And uh, we have these prices that just keep coming and coming and coming. Then we have the issue of unemployment or or um, employment, but the government seems to be employing people now. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and so therefore, we have to be quite, quite careful in, in our approach and try to keep uh, that in mind always and not have that FOMO, you know, fear missing out on this market because the day that we depart on that, that's the day that we run into trouble. We don't want to do that. So after saying that, I will tell you that not telling you that something is happening tomorrow, but we, uh, we have made some offers that were um, unsuccessful. We are in the middle of a couple of offers that we are, uh, I would say, close, real close. And we're, we're still within a couple of days of having a, um, uh, a decision made by the seller. We have put our best uh, offer in we are in uh, past the best and final 
On one, we had an interview with the seller where they chose a couple of the um, uh, offers for uh, an interview, and uh, they don't invite you to those kinds of calls unless they feel like there's a good possibility they're going to lean your way. Um, that in and of itself is, so what? Um, what I will tell you is these are properties in, in located in areas where we would be more than happy to own, and they are deals that would deliver returns. Maybe not as good as uh, you guys have been spoiled to get, but they're still good returns. And for me, what's more important is we want to be able to hedge against a market that rolls over on us. If we have to back up our rents by, say, 5, 10, in, in many cases, not many cases, in some cases it could be 15%, we would still be able to uh, stay afloat, tread water, and not have to come back to our investors with that dreaded term cash call. Okay, That comes right back to what I said about protecting our investors' capital and securing the best return we can. So th that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the other thing is um, that I have completely forgot the second thing I was going to tell you guys. I put it up there. But that's okay because uh, uh, you guys love me and I love you. You love me, right? Okay. So therefore, I can uh, tell you that I did. I, I forgot. All right. What does this mean, Mr. Garrett? ACH. 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 Oh, we'll do that at the end. Yeah, we'll do that at the end. Thank you. Where do you YMCA. get that? Wow. Okay. <laughs> that is my era. Okay, uh, we have a good program for you this evening. It is um, my pleasure to introduce a gentleman who has some insight uh, in the market that um, most of us would not even begin to understand how to acquire it, how to decipher it, and then how to package it in a coherent manner that we can use as investors to um, make intelligent decisions. Uh, if you guys, I'm going to test you, I, if you read our emails, especially our weekly emails, what is the most valuable commodity in the world? You didn't read, did you? You didn't read. The most valuable commodity in the world is information, OK? With good information, you make good decisions. Without information, you make poor decisions, terrible decisions, and catastrophic decisions. So that's why we rely on people like this gentleman that's going to be uh, addressing the group this evening. Um, yes, we as practitioners are in the market daily, and so we have our own perspective and insight. However, it's, um, it's a little more ma uh, micro than macro, and, um, and Bill has a much bigger perspective on the market not to mention that um, he's a pretty smart guy. I, I would think he's probably a little bit smarter than me. Not, not a whole lot, but just a little bit more. Um, where's my clicker? Where is it? It's up there. There we go. Did I already welcome you guys? I can skip this one, right? OK. All right, I am going to be bringing Mr. Bill Kitchens up. Bill happens to be a market analyst at CoStar Group. Anybody know who, what CoStar is? Well, for those of you who don't, CoStar Group is a, uh, an analytical service, uh, but much, much more. And I'll let him expand on it. They provide market data to uh, investors to, um, for the purpose of acquisitions, uh, information for um, us who already own property. They have a massive database of commercial real estate, which uh, goes across the entire spectrum of not only apartment properties, uh, they do um, uh, office, medical, uh, you guys do industrial? Industrial, industrial. Retail. Hey, yeah. I'm talking here. Okay. Okay, Sorry. don't jump in yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to build you up. <laughs> anyway, he is in the enviable position to take this data and, and, and put it in a form that we can use it. And I use it every single day. I don't know of anybody who, uh, where's Ryan? I thought I saw Ryan. You use CoStar? What? Oh, yeah. Get out of here. Uh, but basically, it is a, um, a, a go-to platform for us. And so therefore, um, we are going to be hearing from Bill. Bill's background has been prior to, um, I, I don't, 
my eyes in the back of my head aren't working today, so I'm going to kind of. But uh, prior to uh, being a co-star, you were at RealPage. RealPage is uh, similar uh, in some respects, but not in, in others. Um, basically, it really comes down to the guy has always been in this kind of business, and uh, he brings us uh, some pretty good information. So without further ado, Bill, why don't you come on up, yeah. and uh, I'll let you take this over. All right. And then you can um, expand on anything that I may have left out. Yeah. And then you can take it away. Uh, thanks for the warm uh, welcome, Julian. It's it's great to be here this uh, this evening with you. Um, again, I'm Bill Kitchens. Um, a little bit about myself. You know, I cut my teeth um, uh, in multifamily at RealPage, where I covered other markets outside of DFW. I think your lapel might will pick it up. Are we good? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool outside of DFW, and one of the most rewarding things, I think, being in DFW is, is covering the market that you grew up in. Um, there I went to school, and I'm raising a family here, and like Julian alluded to, we not only cover multifamily, we also cover all the commercial uh, food groups, and being able to see the, the tremendous amount of growth uh, that we've seen over the past decade, and, and either, you know, beyond that has uh, been one of the most uh, rewarding parts of, of my role. And if you had to boil it down, I'd say our job, my job, and folks like me at COSTAR who cover different markets nationally, our job is to tell the narrative of our market. And uh, that's what we're gonna do this evening with the multifamily uh, market specifically. And um, to kick us off, I, I really wanna lay a, a foundation and provide a, a brief economic overview, um, highlight where we are in this recovery, and then underscore some of the demographic uh, foundations that have supported the multifamily market over the past decade. And I'm gonna start with um, the employment situation. And what we're doing is uh, taking employment data and indexing it back to February 2020, and really when, when things really went sideways. And we've included here a DFW, and benchmarked it to, to Texas and to the, the US as a whole. And if we go back, you know, looking at um, the, the different lines here, you know, we see our, the, the, the hit that we took in Texas was much shallower than what we saw um, in the US. It was much shallower than what we saw in some of the, the coastal markets as well, um, down around 88 points here. And since then, our recovery has, has been more robust uh, than what we've seen in the Texas average as well, with that yellow line above uh, the, the green line. Um, other markets in Texas, I think like Houston, I'm thinking about that market specifically, is, is lagging that Texas average a little bit. But based on our latest data through, through August, we are 0.6% uh, away from reaching that uh, pre-pandemic threshold. And, and if I'm honest with myself, I, I think that you know the, the rise of the Delta variant probably disrupted that pace a little bit in the past month or so. Um, but I expect that um, you know we're we're lagging around 23, 24,000 jobs before we reach that peak. And so I have full confidence with with retailers working to staff up for the holidays uh, coming up quickly that we will reach that pre-pandemic threshold. Uh, before the end of the year. And in terms of other markets that have reached that threshold, it's really a, a small group. Um, the, the only other one is in Texas, well, there's one in Texas and in Utah. Austin, of course, is a little bit faster growing than we are. They reached that last year. And then Salt Lake City um, is the next bigger, but uh, Dallas will be one of the larger ones to, to reach the, the finish or this, this threshold faster than others. Um, and I wanted to unpack some of the, the different sectors within our, our job picture. And so what we're looking at is change and, and the number of jobs, again, from that February 2020 uh, peak uh, before the, the pandemic hit, and then trace um, some of the, you know, uh, the outperformers and the under the performers because we know that some segments of the economy uh, were disproportionately impacted than others. Um, specifically, this leisure and hospitality segment. Uh, we're still down um, about 6% from where we were February 2020. Quite frankly, we have a deep hole that we're working to, to dig ourselves out of. Um, we were down uh, double digits you know, back in, in 2020. We're steadily making progress there. 
Um, a, a few others that I'll highlight is really our office using segment. And this is our professional business services, financial uh, activities, and then our, we include it, but it's not necessarily as, as um, uh, heavy in terms of the number of jobs is that information segment. Um, we've fully recovered and surpassed uh, pre-pandemic levels. Really our office using segment is firing on all cylinders. You know, even if, you know, not everyone is returning to in-person uh, offices. And then finally, you'll see this blue spike on the, the right-hand side, this trade, transportation, utility segment. That represents um, a lot of job growth in our booming industrial segment. Um, again, in DFW, you know, we're not talking about industrial, but we lead the country in terms of industrial construction and also uh, leasing, and that segment has been um, uh, firing on all cylinders uh, over the past two years. Uh, switching gears into um, some of the population uh, trends that we've seen, uh, this is a look at population growth from 2019 through 2020. And um, again, DFW uh, leads the pack. We added 120,000 uh, new residents here. And I've shaded um, the, our Texas markets here. You know, we're well represented um, uh, in Texas. And you know, even in, in San Antonio, you know, you know, I'd say you know, um, fast growing areas like Charlotte, um, Orlando, um, even maybe parts of Florida like Tampa, you know, receive a lot of attention. But San Antonio has always flown kind of under the radar, you know, still a respectable position for uh, a market that's not quite as, as large as um, DFW or Houston. And, um, you know, if we go back the past decade, we've added 1.2 million uh, folks growing at a, a 20%, and that's really supported um, growth for our multifamily uh, market. Um, peeling back the onion a little bit, you know, uh, you know, because we are a big metro area, uh, we wanted to track growth across different counties in DFW and, and see, you know, where's the fast growing and where's, you know, um, where's, where's growth a little bit lower. Um, and what we're doing is tracking growth from 2010 through the end of 2020. And again, that dotted line there is uh, the DFW average. Again, we've grown about 20%, which is uh, among the fastest rates for a, mar a metro as our size. Um, and then, you know, you see a pretty uh, uh, impressive growth in our Collin and Denton County uh, areas. And, and, you know, we know our northern suburbs have been really the, the engine for demographic growth in DFW, growing north of 35, 36% over the past decade. And what we've seen uh, over the past, uh, over this time is, you know, looking back, you know, Plano, Frisco, um, Allen, and McKinney, you know, served as kind of quiet bedroom communities. Folks would, you know, more often than not, um, uh, commute closer to downtown and office centers closer to the urban core. And what's shifted is now uh, we're seeing communities like Salina, Prosper, you know, Argyle, you know, these, you know, I'd say almost outposts these, uh, that are working to, you know, incorporate themselves become the suburbs of Frisco with, with Legacy West, uh, with office centers in the north. And so that's, that's kind of the paradigm shift that we've seen more recently. Um, and I think that's only going to continue. And in fact, you know, if we're talking you know, 20 years from now, we might include Grayson County moving up north uh, in terms of our uh, metro uh, definition. Um, meanwhile, you know, we, we're still you know, in, in our more urban counties, you know, we're still seeing uh, growth between uh, 10 and 15 percent. Uh, that's a little bit lower, but quite frankly, that's still respectable uh, compared to more urban counties on, on the expensive coast where like, I'll give an example, like New York City has only grown like 8 percent. Um, but uh, it's, it's not surprising, uh, but still the growth that we've seen is respectable. And again, um, this is just a component of population growth, I, uh, and uh, this net migration really represents, you know, uh, folks coming here uh, versus, you know, other means of population growth, like uh, natural population, um, like having more kids. And as a share of population growth, this accounts for almost 60% of our population growth. And this is cumulated over the past decade. And, 
you know, the narrative goes that we know people are moving here for economic opportunity and for jobs. And again, that's all fuel demand for housing, and that's supported the, the multifamily market um, over, the past, uh, over the past decade. Uh, one of the last macro slides that I wanted to, to highlight is, um, and we've seen the headlines that, that, that have been going on for more than a year now, are uh, supply chain bottlenecks, and that has impacted uh, our ability to really build uh, multifamily housing, not only multifamily, but also single family and other, other types of real estate as well. Uh, this is a look at uh, the producer price index that comes out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and really, I, I want to highlight you know, the, the spikes in all these series at the very end here, um, namely uh, steel and the lumber, steel, um, aluminum, and, and copper. Um, over the past year, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because so many folks are now paying attention to what the spot price for lumber is doing. You know, is it, is it 1,500 board feet or is it, you know, where is it now? Has it come down? Uh, but the bottom line is developers have really been pinched uh, to, to acquire material and to work quickly um, to build uh, new homes. And, and that's particularly important uh, in DFW as a market that tends to build a lot. And, um, and, and quite frankly, I expect this to, to continue to be kind of a pain point for our developers um, in the, the, the next year ahead. Uh, switching gears to, to the investment side, um, and this is a, a slide that I wanted to showcase and then Julian alluded to, to how much competition that we're seeing in the market. Uh, this is a look at all uh, CRE investment broken down by asset type and then ranked uh, by, uh, by the top markets here and DFW has emerged as the leader uh, for CRE sales um, in 2021. Um, we, we started to climb that ladder at the end of last year and uh, we're, we're in a solid position in 2021. And on this, on this slide, you, you're going to see a lot of green and that's driven by, by multifamily sales. We're, we're tracking 12.6 billion year to date um, for, for multifamily transactions. Um, and in a typical, typical year pre-pandemic, we will typically see 9 to 10 billion. Uh, th we're three quarters into this year. We're already 12, you know, north of 12 billion. And in terms of overall sales, it accounts for 51% of total sales in the market. So investors have, have flocked here uh, and, and, and in a way that we haven't seen in the past. And again, pre-pandemic, we'll see generally more capital flow to New York and to, to LA, we're usually lower on the totem pole. But, um, and I highlighted Atlanta and Phoenix. Phoenix comes in second for uh, multifamily sales and Atlanta comes in um, a third. And so a lot of multifamily investors, you know, during a time of a lot of uncertainty have flocked to, to these uh, Sunbelt market or the s Southern markets. And um, that's what's really driving all this volume. So to, to dive into to the, the multifamily market, the overarching theme that we've really seen this year is the tremendous amount of rent growth that we've seen in such a short amount of time. And this data comes from uh, our CoStar Daily Asking Rent series. So at CoStar, um, part of the CoStar family is apartments.com and uh, we are able to collect a lot of daily rent observations through apartments.com by by properties marketing their, uh, their communities online. And in DFW, we, we average something like 400,000 daily rent observations. So it's, it's a very robust series, and we're able to break it out by different product types. And what we've done here is taken our DFW average at the top, and we also at CoStar are able to, to kind of break down properties by, by quality. And our three-star um, properties represent something closer to a B, class B product. And our four and five-star, we, we generally think of as, as class A. And going back to, again, uh, January, pre-pandemic, January 2020, um, looking at this series, you know, very early on in March, we saw the lockdown. We already started to see 
uh, the, a shift in this uh, data series. And we saw a downshift, particularly in our, in our four and five star properties. And throughout the, and by geography, you know, we, we saw um, areas like downtown, like uh, expensive areas like uptown, uh, really um, cut into rent growth. But we also saw some supply heavy submarkets, areas in the northern suburbs, in Collin and Denton counties, uh, uh, see rent cuts as well. Uh, last spring, there's a lot of hand wringing on for for you know leasing agents and property managers working to you know wanting to, to get a, a good jump on the leasing season, uh, and they they as a result they offered concessions, cuts in which cuts into their their rent growth expectations, and actually we saw rent cuts for our, for our class A four and five star uh, segment. What really saved us was our, our deep pool of class B product. Um, and really, you know, if we think about that product, a lot of it goes back to the, early, uh, the late 70s, uh, early 80s before the SNL crisis. That, and that, that, you know, that slice of product has really you know, been a source of stable, um, dependable, as you can see the line here, um, rent growth. And that, as a result, that, that enabled us to end the year on a, on a positive note. Now, since then, we've really seen rent growth kick into high gear. Um, again, almost 14% since January. It's nothing we've ever seen before um, since we've ever covered the market. And through the, you know, the late, uh, through September and October, we're starting to see that pace of growth slow a little bit. Beginning with that Class A product, again, it's a higher price point and it's a little bit more sensitive and we typically do see rent growth slow uh, later in the, the calendar year. But all this growth has been supported by demand and um, a leading indicator of demand that we use at CoStar, again, using our, our friends at, at apartments.com is search activity. And this is search activity, this is just behavior of searches um, for apartments in DFW. Again, going back to January 2020, uh, where we saw uh, uh, searches kind of collapse through, through April, May. Um, and then, you know, we, we did see some, you know, uh, activity pick back up, but we really saw it in earnest uh, to the beginning of early uh, 2021. And um, we're starting to see, you know, searches kind of taper again. That's some seasonal behavior that's expected. But all of that has resulted in this wave of, of demand that we've never seen uh, again in the past. Uh, this is a look at quarterly um, new leases signed. Um, in DFW going back to, to 2021, excuse me, 2020, uh, 2010. And uh, year to date, we're looking at uh, 45, 46,000 new leases signed. And pre-pandemic, you know, typically we're doing pretty well if we do 21, 22 uh, units. So uh, effectively, we've doubled the amount of uh, new leases signed in a matter of, of uh, nine months. And um, there's some drivers of this. You know, the biggest one is that people really just put off big life decisions like moving uh, during the pandemic and really decided to, to move on those uh, this year. But as a result, um, our stabilized vacancy, um, uh, you know, uh, has, has plummeted uh, at 4.4 percent. It's the lowest that we've that we've uh, seen that since we've been tracking the market. And and demand is pervasive. Uh, most areas in DFW are seeing uh, demand surpass what we've have seen in the historical performance, but there are a couple of areas that I want to highlight that have, have, have seen um, pretty impressive demand. And the, the first ones are the, the northern suburbs, you know, Frisco, Prosper, um, Farmers Branch, Carrollton, uh, Allen McKinney, Plano, again, all beneficiaries of the, the, the new leases that we've seen. Um, East Dallas, uh, which is a, a really, you know, big urban, I'd say urban hotspot that offers a really nice blend of some value add and also new properties, uh, really kicked into high gear as well. Um, the section of Fort Worth, uh, Fort Worth is coming off a big supply wave uh, at the end of 2020 and renters really uh, were chasing some of those new properties there as well. Um, People wrote off downtown, people wrote off down, uh, uptown, but we're seeing the demand uh, return there as well. And um, we've, been, we've seen stable uh, absorption in our mid-cities. 
um, and some of our, um, against uh, what I'd call stable submarkets also. But even with this tremendous amount of demand uh, for product this year, we've seen construction activity start to, to soften and start to taper actually. And this is a look at uh, permitting activity uh, going back to 2010 on a, on a rolling basis. And going back, you know, you know, this is for multifamily and single family. And multifamily and single family mostly traced each other over the last economic expansion. <laughs> Um, until 2020, uh, the spring of, or early spring 2020, where we saw permitting activity just collapse. And the feedback from developers was there's a, there's a lot of capital that just froze to, to chase new product projects. Uh, we know that uh, the city of Dallas actually had some, have had persistent issues uh, issuing permits as well, which is, that's created a bottleneck. But as a result of that, we've seen uh, permitting activity taper, we're starting to see activity pick back up, but we're not at the levels where we were, where we're building uh, a ton pre-pandemic in the last expansion. Uh, meanwhile, the, the single family market, again, is, is you know, again, firing on all cylinders where we're, we're seeing headlines of, of new developments pick up in, in a lot of our suburban areas. And uh, the headlines, you know, come out with a new, uh, every week on something new like that. But as a result, uh, we've seen overall construction activity uh, fall uh, from at the end of 2019 and through early 2021 from that 40,000 40, uh, unit mark uh, down to 26,000 units. Um, on a percentage basis, we're about 3.6% uh, of overall, uh, overall inventory. Um, but we're still, you know, as, even as, as construction has, has slowed, we still rank as one of the top uh, markets for construction. Um, we're still behind, um, or we are behind New York, and we're behind LA, uh, but that's a, this is actually a theme that we're, we're tracking nationally. And this is a look at change in construction, just to highlight areas where we've seen the slowdown. Um, Alan McKinney, uh, as, you know, on, a, on a unit basis, has seen the most dramatic uh, decline. Again, Farmers Branch Carrollton, which is a developer, another developer hotspot, uh, East Dallas. Uh, downtown, you know, 2020 was a big year for, for high rises, and uh, we, we saw uh, construction taper there a little bit as well. Um, and then some of our, you know, uh, again, uh, several mid cities and outlying outer ring suburbs, uh, where we're seeing construction really tick higher and where we're seeing more construction starts is in that Frisco Prosper area. Some properties in Frisco specifically, some in Little Elm, but again, some of those, those um, I guess, uh, smaller uh, uh, surrounding communities of these larger suburbs. Uh, this is a quick map of where construction is, is happening right now, and, uh, and it's broken out by zip code here. And the darker areas are, are the number of units underway uh, by that zip code. And I talked about how um, Alan McKinney saw this, you know, this, this decline from what we've seen last year. But even so, our northern suburbs continue to lead uh, the number of units underway. Frisco and Prosper and both Alan McKinney account for about 25% of overall all construction um, in DFW. That entire, uh, that 380 corridor going um, east of Denton through Allen McKinney is, is, is pretty saturated, even as, as overall construction has fallen. Um, south of Fort Worth, you know, the Burleson, Mansfield area, again, that's an area that we're seeing a, a lot of demographic growth, a lot of single family building in that area as well. And we're still uh, seeing properties uh, come to market uh, there as well. Last year, you know, we actually started off January 2020 pretty, pretty strong. And then uh, the, the effects of the, the pandemic hit. And you can see, you know, the amount of, the amount of capital chasing multifamily properties just collapsed through the, the spring and summer. Um, as things stabilized, uh, we saw a transaction uh, pick up and uh, it's, it's been picking up ever since. It's, it's only accelerated. And uh, we have nine months of, of, of 2020, 2021 here. Three of those, are, yeah, three of those nine months were above 1.5 billion, which is driving that 12.6 that billion number that I, I told you about. Now, as a result of this, this has driven up uh, the price per, price per door. 
Um, on average, what we're seeing in the market um, is just under um, 170 a door. Um, prices are up about 13, 14 uh, percent since the beginning of the year. Um, but also, this is, is, is allowed. This is also allowed uh, cap rates to, to, to further compress as well. Um, and as there is, you also will have to see what um, the, the, the remaining of the quarter. But it's going to be an incredibly strong, strong year for 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 sales. And I wanted to highlight where sa uh, different sales are happening based on uh, the product class or the, the pr product quality. And uh, this is a look at all the deals that we are tracking so far through 2021 and broken out again by that star rating. And so the green dots there you see are the, the two and three star properties. Um, the, the orange ones are in that four and five star uh, category. And there's a few themes that I want to, to highlight. And I'm gonna start with the, the four and five. Um, first is, you know, you're gonna see a higher concentration of deals um, closer into the urban core and downtown and um, parts of East Dallas and, um, and uptown and then kind of moving north. And these all the way up to, to Frisco following 75 towards McKinney, um, out towards Louisville as well if you follow 35. And this represents a lot of the newer properties probably built in the last decade or so or recently stabilized properties that a lot of institutional capital has been chasing. Um, we also have some of, the, um, of that present and on the, particularly on the west side of Fort Worth, which is a, a bigger uh, renter hotspot. Meanwhile, the, our, our two and three star, it's, it's quite frankly, it's really three star properties. There might be a handful of two stars, but it's mostly that B-class product. And, and, it, and, and in terms of geography, we're seeing some of the usual suspects uh, in terms of, of locations uh, where folks are targeting. And I'm going to start in the mid-cities there, you know, that um, specifically Arlington, uh, North Richland Hills, the HEB area, again, a very popular target for, for investors. Uh, moving east towards Irving, um, parts of Duncanville, and then around, it, you can kind of trace uh, 635 a little bit. Um, if going from the, you know, the older, some of the older product in Richardson, further south, Garland and Mesquite. Again, these, these are properties that are still popular by investors and still a, a, a hot commodity. So I know that folks, you know, talk about, you know, there's still deals out there and this is, you know, I know in this segment and this is evidence that yes, there is. I want to bring it home on, on fundamentals, and this is again a look at a su supply demand vacancy, and and it includes our, our near term forecast of what we're expecting um, over the next couple of years. Um, we're we're expecting, you know, I talked about 45, 46 thousand new leases signed. I anticipate leasing to to still be pretty robust to the end of the quarter, but we're not going to do what we saw and Q2 or Q3. So we'll probably end up with uh, just north of 50,000 uh, units signed, uh, new, le new leases signed. Um, on the supply side, we're anticipating uh, another you know, 22,000 units to deliver. Again, you know, going back through the last expansion, we're, we're a market that tends to build a lot. And so our vacancy rate has drifted higher. However, given the fact that we've seen twice as much demand as the number of units su supplied, we're going to uh, we're going to end the year on our overall uh, vacancy rate closer to six percent. Um, we have to go back to you know well be before 2010 that we've ever seen a vacancy rate that low. Um, on the supply side, you know I talked about um, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but I do expect uh, uh, you know construction to be less of a factor in the near term, uh, given some of the supply chain constraints and. Uh, and ability for developers to, to source material. Um, and so we're, we're gonna see construction to move forward, but probably not at the same pace as we've seen before. Um, on, the sub, on the demand side, um, I, I'll say our base case, this is our base case scenario. Well, typically, uh, I do think that we'll see something of a normal year next year, closer to, to 22 to 20,000, 22,000 new units signed. Uh, that'll keep our vacancy rate still hovering near that, that 6%. Um, uh, for next year. Um, lower levels of construction will, will support uh, pretty healthy uh, rent growth. I, I don't anticipate rent growth to, to, 
to behave like we saw this year, um, but still be pretty robust. Just a few uh, closing uh, thoughts uh, what we talked about. Um, on, the, on the economic side, again, we're, we're the, what we like to say is we're the cleanest shirt and the dirty ha uh, clothes hamper. We're going we're gonna to recover faster than other parts of the country. And from a demographic uh, perspective, you know, uh, these are drivers, these are structural drivers that uh, were here pre-pandemic. They'll remain post-pandemic, and so that'll enable our, our multifamily uh, market to, to thrive in a post-pandemic post world. Um, I talked about the development uh, uh, pains that developers are, f are feeling. Um, I do expect development to pick up in the longer term, though. Um, we are a market that, that does like to build. And, and if I think about other asset classes, you know, we have a vacancy rate in our office market of 18%. Uh, we have you know, companies that put you know, almost eight nine, percent, not eight, nine million square feet of, of sublease space on the market. But Heinz wants to build an office tower in downtown where most of the buildings are vacant. So if it, that's any clue, I, you know, I think that there's a propensity to build here. And I think we will in the long term. 2020 year has been uh, an incredible, very unusual year for rent growth. I do think we're going to start to see uh, um, a, a, a soft, soft landing for rent growth in 2022. The growth that we're seeing this year will start to come down. Uh, you know, it'll still be very high. I think anywhere from six to, to seven to maybe eight percent in that range. Um, but I expect to normalize as we go into the out years. Um, again, uh, investors have really found DFW. Um, we're starting to see more out of state capital come here than what we've seen in the past. And, and um, it's really put a spotlight on, on not only DFW, but some of our, our southern markets as well. All right. All right. Well, Bill, thanks so much for that information. Of course, uh, I'm sure there are questions uh, in our audience, but I've got a couple. Uh, you mentioned the, the new leases. Mm -hmm. Does that include renewals, or those are new leases? Those are new leases, correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of swapping going back and forth. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I, I mentioned, I only touched on concessions. You know, we do, you know, there's evidence of folks, you know, looking at it, looking for deals last year and jumping on those concessions. You know, they might be in a rude, and for a rude surprise this year, but that is something that we, that we saw last year. And that, that could be a, uh, a contributing factor to those new leases signed. Yeah. Another question that comes to my mind is I'm, I'm looking at properties every day. <clears throat> I'm seeing properties from the late 60s up to the mid, maybe even the latter 80s. A dearth of properties between, say, late 80s mm -hmm. to mid to late 90s. Yeah. Any insight as to why yeah, that is? Yeah, uh, the really, the biggest issue, yeah, if you break it out by, by generation like that, you know, uh, the SNL crisis was, you know, the biggest factor there. Where we're building, um, just really fell off, kind of fell off a cliff. You know, that's not only, that's only uh, uh, evident in the multifamily side. It's also on the office side, and um, and uh, yeah, that's the biggest driver of there. That probably the '86, it might be the the drop off there. But that's really the uh, the biggest driver there. In the last decade, you know, a lot of people think, you know, we did all this building, but really, you know, if you go back, you know, uh, into history and look at what we saw, you know, in other expansions, the 70s and 80s were a wild time in DFW. Um, even in the early 80s, um, there, you know, the TV show, uh, you know, kind of illustrated that. And it was, we were, we were building left and right, whether or not someone was gonna occupy it or not was an afterthought. And on the office side, you know, I talked about double digit vacancies. That's a relic from the 80s um, and, a, and an artifact from, from, from that period. Yeah. And then one last for me, if, yeah. you, if you'll indulge me. Uh, East Dallas, you mentioned East Dallas. Is that uh, Old East Dallas or Far East Dallas? This is Old East Dallas. Okay. Yeah. So you're looking at, um, yeah, uh, Ross Avenue, uh, Live Oak, Gaston, running out towards yeah. White Rock Lake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any questions for Bill? And I've got, if you don't mind, let me pass the microphone to you. Any questions? We've got people online, so that they can hear questions as well. 
So I saw like a huge demand as we are in 2021. Mm -hmm. It's all of a sudden going down, but your supply is still you know, staying even. How are we going to absorb all that demand like it showed like from 2021 to 22, 2022, just all of a sudden drop? Where are those people going to go? Mm -hmm. And who are taking that up? Is it the millennials who pretty much are minimalists and don't want to have a yard and all that, or what? Yeah, I think um, on who's going to absorb it, you know, we, there's still room to absorb. I think if we look at our stabilized vacancy rate, which represents properties that have been um, either that have at least like a 90% occupancy and our overall occupancy, there's still a gap there. So there's still room for, the, you know, there's still. Um, uh, units for people to move into and um, you know in terms of who's who's gonna fill it um, you know I, I talked about folks still relocating here and there's certainly I think generational differences in terms of, of terms of preferences um, you know the Millennials are, are certainly one cohort uh, but you know folks you know not wanting to to maintain a house and pay property taxes and perhaps downside, you know, that's another source of, of renter demand as well. So it all comes down to, to different preferences and, and what, you know, different properties can provide. Uh, so I'm not gonna say it's all gonna come from one place. Uh, uh, so, but, but it, will, it will come, yeah. So when uh, analyzing properties with Julian, we've seen the trend in other income growing and relative to the rent. So I'm just curious on your thoughts on the other income category growing. And it's like all the owners are trying to figure out ways to um, generate revenue and, and uh, kind of uh, management value add. So I was curious if you've seen a, a big shift in that in the last five years, or is that um, just something that we're noticing? And, and I guess I would like to piggyback on that. Is that a metric that you track? It's it's not specifically. Um, could you, in terms of? Uh, well, instead of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what Ben speaking of. Yeah. Um, so we have your basic rent, mm -hmm. and then you have your other income, which includes uh, amenity packages. Oh yeah. And the, that kind of income. It's it's not it's not something that we we specifically track you know if you're looking at you know what kind of income a property is earning um, I think the best glance that we have into it is in terms of um, you know what newer properties are offering but also what rehab properties are they doing to 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 attract renters and to you know remain competitive and we haven't quite frankly honestly we haven't you know broken that down in terms of what that looks like um, you know whether it looks uh, you know um, you know, I'm thinking about was it shared spaces or if it's, you know, sprucing up the landscaping or if it's, you know, specifically applying, you know, I haven't, we haven't really broken that out. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm going to speak to that a little bit, Ben, from, from a management perspective. Uh, great question because we have, you're absolutely right. We're in, again, not, uh, not to go against what Bill's saying, but, you know, there, there is tremendous rent growth at the same time, but we're seeing that that rent growth is kind of pockets. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily every property is having 14%. I think yeah. Bill would agree with that. It's kind of some pockets driving that. But where we are seeing increases across the portfolio is other income. You look at the numbers. Those of you, you know, we send you a monthly statement every month and it's got the financials. And I mean, it is just, it's almost like this with other income. What we're seeing out there from a management perspective is that there is a shift in what people want out there. They want a safe place to live, that they feel comfortable in the environment. They want close to work, so they want convenience. But they do, we, do, we are not getting the call anymore for your granites. I've got to have the granite countertop. I've got to have the brand new cabinets. I've got to have the stainless steel appliances. We're not seeing that anymore. What we're seeing is people saying, give me a nice, safe, clean, convenient location to live, and then provide me with the amenities. The biggest amenity that, that is driving our income has been the tech package. Um, those of you who are investors, you know we talked about the tech package for a long time. And I mean, we've got properties now that are just 50% into the process, and it's fifteen, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000 a month just on the income of that tech package. So what, again, what we're seeing, and I don't, I don't know if Bill can 
corroborate this or not, but what we're seeing from a management perspective is I don't really want, I don't have to have that nice, great granite cabinets place anymore. Give me a nice, safe, clean, convenient place, and I'm willing to pay for the amenities that you provide me. So whether it's tech package, whether it's valet trash, it's some things that you might not think of, but that's really what's driving the other income, Ben. So how, much is, how much is granite right now? It's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah. As, as uh, everything yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everything's expensive. And not yeah. only is it expensive, it's hard to get. Yeah. Um, one of the things, too, that is driving some of this as well, and uh, Ben and I were talking about this a little earlier, is just the supply chain. It is difficult to get supplies. It's down to things like paint, trying to fix an AC, three months on, an, on a refrigerator. You want a refrigerator? Okay, get in line. Everybody wants a refrigerator. It's just, it's, it's uh, anyway, it is what it is, so. Brian, before you uh, uh, take the sec uh, next question, I wanted to expand just a little bit. And one other thing that we find our tenants are asking, I always like to say that I'm in the people business first. They absolutely want great customer service. Customer service is almost every day something that they are encountering at most properties to be subpar. We try to be the exact opposite, but that is, uh, it's an amenity, if it's not a uh, uh, physical amenity, but it is something that's uh, paramount to our, our uh, tenants. Right, it's, a must. it's absolutely a must, with a good attitude. Uh, one, one thing I'm, I'm sure is going to happen over the next five years or so, inflation rates are going to go, are going to go up very, very sharply because of all of the money the Fed has been printing. So interest rates are going to go up, the infl inflation rate's going to go up. How are those things going to affect the market? Mm -hmm. And in an inflationary economy, the only people that win are the debtors. So does that, how much does that help the multifamily investor that we're paying back with inflated money? Yeah, I, I think, um, so the Fed is going to taper at some point, and uh, the question is, you know, uh, the, the, ti the timing of that and, um, and how much. Um, and I think that there's, there's a fair amount of uncertainty in terms of, of where that's headed even among the, uh, 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 professional macroeconomists and where the Fed is, is directing uh, or, or where they're headed right now. Um, and I, I'll give you an example that um, uh, there, there's not consensus among some of their, their, own, their own folks. And um, tomorrow we'll get the notes from the September FMOC meeting in terms of where they're thinking about uh, uh, rate raises. Um, but if they do it, they'll, they'll do it incrementally. Um, in terms of, you know, the investment, you know, uh, you know, it, it could it eat into potential earnings in the long run, but it, quite frankly, I'm not necessarily um, as concerned about the, f you know, the Fed's impact on, inf you know, inflation rates and, and pulling back and tapering. Uh, in terms of what's driving prices right now, um, I think the supply chain is is a much bigger threat, more a bigger direct threat. Um, right now, and I, th I think that uh, the, the bottlenecks that we're seeing that not only impact, you know, developers, it impacts consumers as well, and that's going uh, to extend into to 2022. Um, and the extreme example, you know, we've talked about of a, a chip shortage. Um, I think that, you know, you, and to produce a, a piece of technology like that uh, takes years and lots of capital to, to achieve that and to overcome. Uh, the, 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 the deficit of that is going to take years, so um, I'm less concerned about uh, the direction that um, the Fed is going to uh, go. I mean, this, this morning that um, Rafael Bostic, the president of the, the Atlantic Fed, uh, kind of deviated from his, his crowd saying that, you know, inflation is, is more of a threat than, than, than what the, the Jerome Powell is, is saying. So um, I, I don't think that there's consensus. Tomorrow we're going to look at uh, 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 a look at what CPI looks like, the, the latest data from CPI. Um, but I, I'm less concerned about um, an overinflationary um, environment, 
even, even longer term because rates have been so low for so long. I, I, I don't think that um, it's as much of a threat as some of the, uh, the other issues that are driving up prices right now. Hey Bob, I think uh, to his point as well is that I, I believe inflation is more transitory right now. I think uh, business will ultimately figure it out. It's not in their best interest not to, whether it's the producers or the suppliers or the, uh, the contractors who are actually dealing with the end product. Somebody is going to figure this out, and um, I, I just don't believe this is going to be the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back or whatever metaphor you want to use. I think this transitory, I think probably by uh, mid-next year, we, we won't even be talking about inflation. I could be wrong, but I did say it to Holland Inn Express last night, so <laughs> I do know some things. I, I just don't believe uh, this is going to be. I'm sorry? Oh, I, I don't. I don't disagree. I'm talking about the, the 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 inflation that we're seeing now is more a result of the supply chain disruption, uh, COVID, um, China not being able to produce the goods, the ports. I think uh, yeah, Brian and I were talking about earlier, and Brian mentioned something which was lost on me that our major ports in this country don't operate 24/7. I mean, I mean, we got ships sitting outside the port of Long Beach in California by uh, dozens and dozens of major container ships, in fact, hundreds of them, and they should be pulling in 24-7 instead. By, I think by 9 o'clock, they shut down. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Well, I'm guessing that'll fix itself in maybe six months to a year. Is that I think so. And I think from, a, from an industrial perspective, um, what Julian says, you know, a lot of the producers will work to find a solution here. And you know, if we connect it back to commercial real estate, we're, we're seeing you know, manufacturers looking for, for opportunities to onshore uh, operations and to reduce or mitigate um, any future disruption to supply chain uh, that was a result of the pandemic. And um, which kind of really bodes well for, for our industrial segment um, nationally, uh, but also here in, in DFW actually. Um, so that's, that's another thing that we're, we're looking at. Questions? I think we've answered all the questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with some, just a couple close? of announcements. Okay. Well, I um, don't have much else to say other than a um, couple of ha housekeeping items. Um, you are probably aware of the um, U.S. Postal Service saying they're going to cut back or have um, initiated a uh, uh, program to cut back or slow down the mail. Has, have you heard about this? I bring this up because it was in the news, is in the news, is fact. Uh, we get calls every month that they have not received their check, their monthly distribution check. Sometimes it's just delayed, sometimes it's lost, and in fact we've had instances where we have sent you two checks because it was a paper check. Anybody received two checks? I know I did. If you were in Oakview, you got two if checks. If you were in Oakview, you got two checks. Anyway, I bring all this up because it is an initiative that we have undertaken to tr turn our entire investor base over to ACH, electronic um, uh, deposits. A couple of reasons. If anybody watches television or hears an ad on the radio about a product, they always talk about shipping and handling. $19.99 plus $6 shipping and handling. That's shipping and handling. Somebody's got to handle that, all right? We print hundreds of checks and have to handle them, print them, and send them through the U.S. mail. Creates a lot of problems. It is a burden on our, our workers, and it is lost um, revenue that could be captured. Remember, for every $1 that goes to our bottom line, it increases our property between $14 to $17. So think about it as an investor. It is in your best interest in so many ways. One, you get your money faster. There's no disruptions with weather or just lost mail or slow delivery. And I mean, to me, we're in the 21st century. This is where we ought to be. I know there's some of you out there, and forgive me if this kind of irks you, that love to see that check come in the mail, right? Probably one of them, right? <laughs> um, 
as much as we 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 appreciate and understand where uh, you're coming from, that's yesterday, guys. We need to move into a completely different era, and it will save our people from the burden that it is to print all these checks and mail them out every day to uh, faster delivery and greater producti productivity for our people and a, a larger bottom line for you folks. Just to, on, on that same topic, you may not be aware of this, but all of your checks come directly from the property. So when he talks about the staff and the handling, that's your manager, that's your assistant manager, that's your leasing agent who is stopping to write checks yep. as opposed to leasing to a customer. So Now, I don't want to be the ugly guy here, but it is within my authority to make you go to ACH. <laughs> and it is. And I can tell you, if you don't go to ACH by this month, you get no distribution, you will have to transfer. So I'm just asking you nicely, please do it for your sake, because I don't want to be the ugly. I'm such a nice, sweet, lovable guy. Don't make me be the ugly guy. Uh, All right. A couple of people online asked, would you just give them a quick update on Silver Creek status? Silver, Silver Creek. Creek. Um, anybody here in Silver Creek? All right. Well, Silver Creek, I was fortunate enough to um, get our uh, broker to move quickly on this, and we have gone through, I would say, about two-thirds of our due diligence or from the buyer's due diligence so it's moving along quite nicely and we expect to be completed uh, the due diligence be completed you would know better than i on the timeline it was about another week or yeah they've got they got seven more days of due yeah, diligence seven more time. days and then it's done and then we get another four hundred fifty thousand in earnest money that goes hard non-refundable and they have made good headway with their lender um, so we don't see any reason why this thing won't close. Um, if something comes up, it'll be just procedural or something that, that really is not a material problem with the property. Um, so we're on our way to getting Silver Creek sold off the, uh, the portfolio books. And it will be a nice little return for you folks who have been real troopers and waited for that distribution. Well, your distribution is coming, and it's going to be a pretty good size distribution. So that's a good one. Again, uh, what I alluded to earlier, we were looking at some additional properties. Hopefully, by uh, the end of this week, I'll have uh, an announcement that I will prepare for next week and let you know that we have been successful. So both the both fingers crossed, and we will have uh, at least one, but potentially two. And what we're going to do, if uh, all goes well, and I spoke with Darwin earlier today, what I want to do is combine both properties and make it a portfolio. All right? Uh, I think that's pretty much uh, for me. If yeah, just, just a couple of things here to help, help finish up. And again, um, I feel neglected if I don't get to talk. You know, I do most of the talking, and I feel out of place tonight. So We didn't uh, hear the did you know. Yeah, well, I just, I, I would really, uh, if, if I could see a show of hands, all those that are first time with us tonight, first time in a DGRE meeting. Okay, I see five, six people, okay? Would you please allow us to get an opportunity to meet you before you leave? Please talk to Julian, reach out to Garrett, raise your hand, reach out to me. We'd just like to say thank you for coming, answer any questions that you might have. But always remember that, and Julian said this at the beginning of the, of the it's a dangerous time. That doesn't mean there's not opportunities, and you know we're going to find them. Oh, yeah. It just means that we need to be careful. We appreciate the fact that you've been patient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, we get dozens of calls a day. When's your next property? When's your next property? When's your next property? Everybody's looking for the same properties. Everybody's been on the same properties. But I can tell you this. We're not going to get into a property just to get into a property. We're going to get into a property that you are going to be thrilled with, that you're going to be happy with, that you're going to be happy with. We could go out and buy anything, but that's not what we do. I'd invite you before you leave to look at the returns on the properties on this wall up here. Kind of a wall of fame, so to speak. That's what we're looking for for you, okay? So appreciate your patience and always know that, you know, you've heard our motto a thousand times. We want to do what's right for the investors. Without you, we're not here. We've got to do what's right for the investors so you keep coming back. You keep coming back with your money. And then last but not least, Bill, thank you for being here. This is just invaluable information. It's stuff that Julian uses on a daily basis. Darwin uses it on a daily basis. But without this type of information out there, it's just... Uh, you know, it's kind of a throwing dart shot in the dark. So, Bill, thank you very much for taking your time evening this evening for joining us. And thank you for coming. And uh, come back and see us again. And uh, that's all I got.